Welcome to Sagas and Sass Season 3. I'm Tara, along with fellow hosts, all of us here together in the same what? virtual room, Nick, Jonathan, and Nami! Woo! Yay! <laughs> it's been so long since we've all been on. I know! <laughs> so excited I punched the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Just punching walls over here. We're so excited. Wow. Well, oh this episode will cover parts one and two of Senlin Ascends, the first installment of Josiah Bancroft's Book of Babel series. And if you're watching live, join us in the chat or after the fact, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Sagas and Sass to continue the conversation. And just a reminder, the views expressed in this show are those of the hosts as individuals and do not necessarily represent the show as a whole. All right, we're glad to be back and excited to open up season three with Senlin Ascends, a book about Thomas Senlin, who is a super awkward know-it-all schoolmaster who kind of creepily falls in love with and then marries one of his former students, Maria, who is 10 years younger than him. The story really begins when they head off to the Tower of Babel and for their honeymoon. And despite the fact that Sunlin has obsessively studied the tower, it turns out that everything he's read is mostly bullshit and he really doesn't know much of anything about it. He immediately loses sight of Maria and spends days searching the market at the base of the tower before he finally decides to go inside. So he enters the tower's lowest level called the basement, where he immediately makes mistake number two by trusting a young man named Adam who then robs him. Luckily, wink, wink, he goes to buy a change of clothes and runs into a man named Fen Gall, selling one of his bags. Gall then returns the bag and they go drinking together, which sounds like fun because the beer is free, but you also have to work for it by peddling the sort of like merry-go-round thingy, which sounds like trying to ride the teacups at Disney World after you've had a bunch of drinks, so. Uh, no thanks, am I right? Oh God, I'm so out of practice. <laughs> <laughs> Ignore that, guys. Please pretend this was <laughs> seamless. <laughs> so finally, Stenlin ascends. <laughs> see, see, see what we did there? <laughs> to the second level, which is called the parlor. And it turns out to be a lot like Sleep No More in New York City, but like only with murder and stuff. If you don't know Sleep No More, look it up. The TLDR of this level is that it is a play in which every person who arrives at the parlor has to play a part. Oh, and they're supposed to be stuck doing so for a whole week. Although, Sunland doesn't last that long because, you know, the aforementioned murder and stuff. Sunless escapes. Wow. I'm really doing great. <laughs> Sedlin escapes with one of the other actors, a woman named Edith, but they weren't supposed to leave no matter what. So they get locked in a metal cage that hangs outside the tower until someone reviews their case. What? As it turns out, Sedlin is released, but Edith is sentenced to branding and banishment from the tower. Sedlin, nice guy TM. That he is, stares with her while she's branded, but they insist that he leaves soon after, and sh sh after she passes out from the pain. And to make the entire thing even more wacky, turns out the people doing the lawyering and the convicting and the branding are all also people thinking that they're acting. Why? <laughs> Next up is the bath, and Senlin finally feels like he's ascended, hardy har har, to a place that represents what he really thought the tower would be like, because it's like fancy and stuff. At first, he spends his time going from hotel to hotel, inquiring about Mari. I, I've been pronouncing it Maria. Someone's yeah. Nick, you said Maria. I think it's, it's Maria. Maria. I think it's well. I yeah. I don't know. I've always pronounced it Maria because it's a Y, but it could be Maria and. I don't think there's, I don't know if there's audio books of these yet. So there is, that's there all are. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So it is Maria. I don't remember. Oh. <laughs> I literally was just listening to it. Like I finished. Yesterday. Uh, I mean, listen, it can so... be like Genya where we just pronounce, we all just pronounce it however the fuck we want. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I'll stay, st stick with Maria anyway, but eventually he loses hope. And it's then that he meets a man named Taro. They become fast friends, and for a while, Senlin does nothing but hang out by the fountains, drink wine, and dine with his new best friend forever. Unfortunately, Senlin begins running out of money and also experiences some pretty disturbing things, including a public execution and discovering a book that details what is essentially a tower-based sex trafficking ring. 
Fucking gross. And then finally, a sign of Maria. Her Haru gets drunk and knocks over a painter's work in progress, and the woman in the painting looks like just like Senlin's lost wife. So Senlin spills his beans to the painter, Ogier, who then admits he paid Maria to sit for him, but refuses to go into any more detail unless Senlin recovers a painting that he was stolen from him by the commissioner. What follows could on its own be the plot of a very weird heist movie, but the TLDR is that eventually Sendling gets a hold of the painting. On his way to return it to Ogier, he sees Tarot, Taro, I think it's Tarot, being turned into a Hod, a person who has become indebted to the tower and is therefore forced into what is essentially indentured servitude. Of course, Sendling himself can't do anything and continues on his way to meet with the painter. Once Ogier has his painting back, he admits that Maria disappeared after telling him that she met uh, with a man who claimed he could help her locate her husband. It's basically totally obvious that Maria fell in with one of the people who runs the trafficking ring, probably after catching the notice of a wealthy man who saw her play piano at a party. At this point, Senlin has attracted like way too much attention, plus he has to keep ascending in the tower in hopes of eventually catching up with Maria, so we close out part two with him, shall we say, on his way to leveling up. <laughs> I haven't read it, but there's also like a tower webtoon. Um, so there's a I haven't read it, but there's also a like a tower level ascending based webtoon. I cannot remember what it's called, but the whole time, every single time you made an ascending pun, I was just like tower stories. Tower stories. I don't even know if it's a pun so much as it's just using the title as much as possible uh like they sometimes do in uh there's you know like movies or tv shows where they yeah. just the, the episode title or the actual title they just like blatantly say it out loud obnoxiously and it's just like or maybe not even obnoxiously but... the ring. yeah yeah how do the credits do though i don't know that i clocked um bancroft using the word ascends in the book or like obviously enough that I was like, excuse me, sir, are you doing this? No, I don't think sure he did. did. Exactly. Tara being clever. Yeah. yeah and well. I was gonna say, honestly, I was gonna say like props to, to Bancroft for like having the restraint to not do that because I would not. <laughs> uh, when I first read this book back in like 2014, I was just, I've read a lot of self-published books in my time. I've written a couple self-published books. Um, I was shocked that, I, like, I, I remember reading this and thinking, how is this not, a, I've never read a self-published book this good, ever. Um, so, really? uh, yeah, and I've read I've read a lot of them, but honestly, maybe it's just my luck. Most of them has been, have been like really bad. So, you know, I but mean, regardless, Fifty Shades of Grey started as a self published book. So, Are we, is that supposed to improve our opinion? Or <laughs> no, I'm not talking a, shit. Go ahead, go I ahead. I worked for a self publisher for six and a half years, and uh, I fully believe that there is a wide range of quality mm -hmm. in self-published works but the vast majority of it falls outside of the realm of things that i would say i would uh voluntarily read yeah i mean <laughs> that was incredibly diplomatically generous I, I mean, I and and listen, I, I'm not like I'm not saying every self-published book I've read has been bad. I'm just saying that of the ones that I've read, I was just this was the first one I was truly like, I am so into this. I'm into this world. I will say, you know, uh, we'd actually chosen this book for the Ice and Fire Con book club for 2021 back when we thought we were having the con in person, and we did a we did actually do a virtual panel on it um, anyway, but. Uh, you know, one of the things that the other people who read it said were that they, you know, th no, they didn't like Senlin and it was hard to get into because of Senlin. I didn't quite feel that way. Like he's maddening and annoying. And the whole thing with Maria, like when you've realized how much younger she is and that she was his student is a lot. Yeah. But uh, I had a moment when I realized she was his student because that's like chapter like the second to last chapter that yeah, ends really... part two and mm. i literally read it like 20 minutes ago like just before we finished we just before we started <laughs> I, I i think i've i think i've read too much history in that 
if this took if this book had took place in 2000 even 20 or even 1980 yeah that's really creepy and terrible but being that it's theoretically this 1800s with some te extra technology realizing it that wasn't that unusual so i just i, put it I firmly mind. say no to that in all aspects yeah, it, yeah i know it, but in my it, mind it just well, to me though it, just, it doesn't matter if it's modern literature modern values are ascribed to it therefore it is creepy however i will say that i did not read this as creepy because from Senlin's point of view, he never actually like views her as anything but a student. Mm -hmm. And since we have his point of view, it wasn't creepy to me because it wasn't like he was interacting with her and he was in love with her at that time. He was just like, this is my annoying student. Why is she annoying me with stupid questions? Like, is the sun made out of coal or was the tower built by beetles? She's just being the worst little grubby snot-nosed kid, and I'm a teacher, damn it! And that was the vibes I got from him. And then, like, after that, you get a, oh, and then she became my friend. And I was like, oh, yay, friend! And then it's well, only when first she... First his best student. First well, yeah, became... but, but, like, it's only when she leaves and, like, kisses him as she leaves, and by this point, it's like she's an adult who's going to college, that she kisses him, and then he's like, oh, romance? With with Maria? Let me think about Maria now. And so that's why I didn't read it as creepy. I admit, when it started off with a description of her as a student, I'm like, oh, fuck, are we going here? Is this really happening? And then I read the chapter and I was like, oh, okay. The male gaze is really fucking sexual at all times. And Senlin is the awkwardest dude in the world. So he would have, he would have done something like you have like the like scene just before when he like goes into the party and the lady wearing the corset looks at him and she like hikes up her skirt and he's like sin and she notices him and she's like and she like pushes on her corset and lifts her titty and he's like sin and like <laughs> you know if Stenlin had any sort of thought like that based off of what he know we know about him as a narrator that he would have already done it he would have like said it in his head because as much as Senlin can be annoying he's also like so far at least he's very critical of himself so he seems like the sort of person who if he you know had the hots for a girl would uh, like talk about it in his POV because he talks about literally everything you know well, also, he... it didn't read as creepy to me and it read as him being like my former student, who is now a grown woman, goes to college, and just as she leaves, she kisses me? What? Am I supposed to romance? He's a total square. Well, yeah, it's not yeah. even just that he's a total square. It's that he is a fairly non-sexual character. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and, and to your point, Nami, like every time that something sexual, like even remotely sexual, not even like actively sexual, comes up in the book, he... Mm -hmm. Basically like, goes oh, away from it. Off this giant gown, and he's like, "No!" And she's like, "Why? Why up, because of you?" Up to the point where, uh, when Maria is literally like putting moves on him, he's like turning away from her and uh, is uncomfortable about it. So, oh yeah, yeah. You have the scene where she starts to put moves on him, and then he yep. only responds when she starts like asking trivia questions. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so and, you know, I don't know that it's written that uh, Senlin is ace or anything like that, but it, it it is. You get very a very clear message that he is not a sexual person and is definitely uncomfortable with things that are sexual. Yeah. Yeah. I never like even. You know, there, if that chapter had occurred with any other, with like another book that I was just reading casually and the character did end up being this creepy lusting after children dude, I would have immediately put it down. And the fact that I didn't feel that creepiness and I was like, heck yeah, let's keep going. I'm so excited. And like, I literally kept almost reading into the next part. And then I was like, you know, maybe I should just actually stop here so I don't spoil it. <laughs> It was 10 minutes before the webcast, and I was like, oh, I I'm glad it. that I reread this almost a year ago, so I can't, it's it's going to be really, like, I'm not going to spoil anything. Otherwise, I'd be screwed. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, and, and like, it's, it is one of those things where it's like, it's no matter what this the student teacher thing is weird to me, even if it was Maria who came on to yes. him, whatever. But you're right. I don't, like, 
I don't think Senlin is this just creeper dude who like started an inappropriate relationship with his students, you know, student, whatever. Um, yeah, the I, reason I, I say it is that I wouldn't characterize Senlin as creepy. I would characterize him as incredibly awkward, not good with people in general, and extremely averse to any sort of romantic interest, but not creepy. Good job, buddy. <laughs> well, he's very, you know, he's very sheltered, right? Uh, he thinks he knows everything yes. about the world, yeah. but he's never left his little seaside village. Yes. Yeah, this exactly. Like mans. But he's read <laughs> books. <laughs> yes, and as we all know, when you read lots of books, you know everything about the world. This uh, little man's. He knows very book smart, no street smarts, as is proven literally in the first like chapter. Um, you know, and and I think that one thing I wanted to point out was the fact that each chapter starts with a quote from this book that he has been obsessively reading for whoever knows how long. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called The Everyman's Guide to the Tower of Babel. So each chapter starts with a quote from the book, but that chapter or it, usually I think it's in right in the next chapter, it goes, whatever happens in that chapter proves whatever was in that quote was misleading or at the very least misleading. Um, yeah. You know, I the every man's know, guide, like, I think the only really good advice it gave was don't lose sight of your loved ones. <laughs> like, like, which Senlin immediately does. <laughs> I, feel like, this man. I feel like whoever's running like the Tower of Babel's like advertising is doing a really good job. Yeah, like, no, absolutely. People got no idea what it's really like. <laughs> also, their marketing is like top notch. Also, I I know I'm wandering again, but like Senlin's obsession with the book and its guidance and how it is at the beginning of every chapter kind of leads me to the reveal of how Maria sped through everything so fast despite oh, yeah. knowing nothing. <laughs> She just knows all the hacks. Like, <laughs> Maria's already in the baths and Sedlin is just collapsed in the basement drinking beer because well, he's well, dying. Part it, but part of it is she went first, right? Didn't he wait a while before he went in? Well, yes. He, Yeah, it was a but few also, days. But the difference is Maria... Was, was it days or weeks? No, it was days. days. It was it days. Was two days and then he went in and then he fucked everything up. Right, so that I know. Everything up. And Mario fact, like immediately goes in. Yeah, the fact that he was so close behind her in the baths, like I think he was only like two days behind her in the baths. Um, yeah. But she spent a whole week in the parlor, right? Yeah. Whereas yeah. he didn't. Or wait, is, yeah, she spent a whole week in the parlor. She would have had to, yeah. Yeah, because she doesn't everybody, buy that. Sort of yeah, everybody has to spend a week in the parlor. The only reason Sandlin doesn't spend a whole week in the parlor is because murder and stuff. Yes. <laughs> and stuff. Um. So, uh, now since we're talking, I don't, I don't want to jump right into the parlor. Let's, um, let's go back to the to the basement real quick. Uh, so they both enter the basement. Maria must have passed through the basement real damn quick. Um, a day. I, I couldn't have been, it couldn't have been very long at all. Um, Senlin, meanwhile, you know, screws up, gets his shit stolen, meets up with uh, Finn Gol. Gol, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. You know, who has his luggage and, uh, whatever they they do the beer the beer me go round or beer go round or whatever I, I can't remember exactly what it's called but it's mean? something like beer go round or beer me go round um and you know the 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 beer go round i think it's one of those things where senlin takes note of it and and how it works right like everybody pedals and pedals and pedals and gets free beer and then it gets to a point where it reaches like capacity and it stops and I think people get thrown off because they're too drunk a lot of the time. Like, not all the time, but... Well, 
what happens is like, I kind of imagine like, like a spring pedaling me mechanism. So yeah. it kind of like winds the spring as it pedals and it can only be cranked so far. And once it reaches that capacitance, it unwinds everything at once. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so once, so once it, when it's doing that unwind, people can and will get thrown off if they're too drunk. Stenlin though, holds on, stumbles off and vomits like a champion. <laughs> Big mood, buddy. That's what I did. We've all been there. <laughs> I was seriously all I could think about was like, and I know it's a, it's a, it's a merry-go-round type, like a carous, not a carousel, really, but like a merry-go-round type thing. So you're, but all I could think of was like, if you got drunk in, like in the, like I wrote in the summer, if you got drunk and went on the teacups at Disney World or Disneyland, like. Uh, no, a I get sick on the teacups enough without being drunk, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I like I was picturing initially a carousel and then what turns into the teacups of hell. Just um, a fun little fun little carousel, the teacups. But yeah, so he you know he gets this like advice from his bud who's like, you know, watch your step, be careful, whatever. And you know, someone's like, well, be my guide. And the guy's like, no, 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 you gotta do this on your own, man. So he goes from, you know, his time in the basement is kind of, it's kind of short, you know, clearly longer than Maria's, but he, he just, it's mistake after mistake with him. He loses Maria. He goes into the basement. He, he gets all his stuff stolen by this kid, Adam. He, you know, does the, the beer me go around, whatever, gets some advice from Finn and goes, you know, then he's on his way to the parlor. Um, so I only know the the kind of basics of what sleep no more in New York City is, but Navi <laughs> is an expert. So, I was reading yeah. this last night, or rather, I was reading the parlor section last night, and the minute I got to it, it just gave me like major sleep no more vibes. And for reference, what Sleep No More is, it's sort of like interactive theater. So it takes place in this warehouse in New York. It's run over three hours. And every hour, a store, uh, the actors perform a silent film noir inspired portrayal of Macbeth. And the, uh, and the uh, acting itself is fully silent. So there are no, so there's no talking except for like certain like screams and stuff like that. Cause you know, in Macbeth, people do get murdered a little bit. Um, spoilers, so, Nami. Sorry, spoilers for, for Shakespeare, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert, you guys. <laughs> but so in Sleep No More, the audience is given like, masks hilariously i know we got mask trauma now but it's fine so you're given like white crow masks that designate you as an audience member and you can walk around the entire like five floors where the show takes place and witness the story and there's like and basically you are not allowed to like touch or like interact with the actors but you can you know look through the props watch a story follow a character just sit in one place and watch everything that occurs in that one room you know and i've been multiple times i've done the thing where i chased after macbeth who literally will run up and down five flights of stairs at once so i was way more fit back then <laughs> wear sneakers but basically the i the whole like concept of sleep more is that like the more you know what's kind of going on the more you can get involved into the story and you can like witness like special scenes or like one-on-one -on -one interactions with like certain characters in the show and like there's a lot of nuance to it obviously you're not actually in the show but you are a part of the show's experience as it were because it's like it's so so cool because like the whole warehouse it's very like film noir and it's set up like an old time he's like 1920s hotel and like there's like music is very like 1920s jazzy but then also like alfred hitchcock and it's like it's very very cool very atmospheric and ambient and there's just something so cool about like the spookiness of being in one of those rooms with like all the audience in like their matching crow masks and it's it's not a horror show it's not meant to be a scary show but it's certainly like a thrilling experience and it's so so cool and i love it so much and like the whole vibes of this was like, mm -hmm. what is that? But on crack and no supervision. <laughs> and we left you real swords for some fucking reason. 
Don't yeah. Forget, I, don't forget real fire. Yeah. Real fire. Real fire, real sword. Well, like, they, they obviously crazy. don't do any sort of like mental health check on the people before they cast them. Nope. <laughs> <sighs> no setting. The only rule is go through the door with your character's letter and stoke the goddamn fire, or we will brand you. Also, you can only leave through the door that you came in through. Oh, oh, also, also, if you do murder somebody, we'll probably shoot you. Probably. But that's only if you go rampaging into the public areas. Unclear Unless that happening. was all part of the show and that was all an act. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> it was not, though. It was not. Um, but that said, uh, when I was actually, actually, when I was writing my summary, I totally forgot, like, it wasn't so much that they left through the wrong door or that they left at all. What they were really, or what, uh, I think, oh, what Edith... It, that was why they got in trouble. But the reason Edith got branded and banished from the tower is because she didn't stoke the fires. Yeah, and some of the fires went out. Specifically, yeah. she specifically didn't some of them went out. And they were like, oh, Sunland, you remembered to stoke the fires even when you were like being chased for your life. Like, oh my God. Like, what? <laughs> yeah, and I just, I, <sighs> it was to me, the whole thing with the parlor was like, at first I was like, so like, I, w I was like ready. I was like, I know something's gonna go wrong here, but what could it possibly be? It's gonna have to be subtle. It's gonna have to be something different. And then that dude straight up gets murdered. And I'm like- And just like right away what? too. Yeah, no, it wasn't even like he got a breath. Actually, wait, no, that's a lie. He did eat that beef. He sat in the <laughs> kitchen and ate some beef. That's true. Yeah, he ate some beef and then the dude died. But to be fair, uh, let's, you know, Maria, Maria is like a week ahead of, or Maria is so ahead of Senlin at this point that it's like something had to happen immediately, right? He couldn't have to spend a week in the parlor playing this role. And also, wow, a whole ass week just being a butler, yep. stoking well, fires. People spend a lifetime being a butler and stoking fires. So I don't see I know I that, but this is, I mean, this, you know what I mean? This is, this is like a, he's supposed to be in a play. He's play acting, right? I, I mean, and also, I mean, I, it, it begs the question, like what happens, you know, like Edith was the wife, right? So what yep. happens when the husband decides that he wants to be a husband physically with some woman I, that, you know, like, Ooh, I just, well, that's one of the interesting things, right? Like, because you're allowed to do what you want. Yeah. So like <laughs> it is, it is implied heavily that that happens and that that is one of the reasons why people might go back is because they not only get to escape their life, in the sense of, you know, being in this show uh, for, I guess, whatever show, maybe it's the wrong word. But anyway, like it is an opportunity to explore all those different sides. And yes, people clearly get murdered and it's not a like unheard of thing because they have processes for that. Yeah. And I think the part that like kind of blew me away was that their processes are just wrapped up in another show. Mm -hmm. Like, I was expecting something to be real there. And the part, like, because, like, as Senlin leaves, the guy who is his lawyer, who basically sentences Edith to be branded and says that Senlin can leave, he's like, Hey, dude, that was such a great performance. You did a great job. What about <laughs> me, dude? Did you think I did a good job? And suddenly it's just like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> it is just like, so like, it sort of just made me think that at any time, there's probably billions of like multiple place settings within that area. And no matter what mm -hmm. they need on that floor, they can pull into it in a place setting. And then due to the place setting, they can convince people to do terrible things to other people in the name of, oh, it's not real. And I kind of like, I wonder how they justify or how they like explain away 
the torture on that floor, you know, or like the branding and like the removing of eyeballs, which is like the consequence of being kicked out of the parlor, which also, what? What? <laughs> but, but like the way that like all of this is like, it's clearly so cleverly thought out. And in a way I like that Bancroft didn't give us an answer to mm -hmm. like, how it is because now i can sit here and like literally i've just been thinking about the parlor head empty no thoughts only parlor for 24 <laughs> hours because i'm just like, like what do they tell these people like how do they convince them that like the branding is okay and that this nurse is doing what she's supposed to be doing like who is edith in this lawyer actor's mind that she should be branded for real because it's clear that she is being branded but also who is senlin that he would like act to be such close like, what? Well, and part of that's, I think, <laughs> that, you know, you've got, it, it, it is, uh, what's it called? Crap. I think there's a, a word or a phrase for it. But essentially, like, because you're compartmentalized and everything, Sinlin doesn't know that the, the guy who is sentencing them is an actor. I would bet a lot of money that they've set it up so that the guy who is, uh, sentencing them doesn't know that the nurses are actors, you know, so you set it up like that. And then you also create an environment where it's like, um, and again, I can't think of the, 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 the words for it, but it's like, because you are creating a barrier between reality and fiction, it is easier to accept that something horrible might happen. And, that it is okay that that just happened. So it is easier for the uh, actors who are sentencing people to accept that this person was branded or this person had their eye removed because there is a, a barrier between what is really happening and what is fictionally happening. And so even though it is really happening and right in front of their face, there's still that part of them that is saying, this is a fiction or this is a, uh, a, a part of something that is a, a, a network that like it all fits together. And so I don't have to understand all of it. It's, it, it is one of the most basic ways that we are controlled as human beings. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and again, like his time in his time in the baths is really the longest, mm -hmm. you know, period of time that we cover in the first two parts of this book. But I argue that his time in the parlor is the most interesting. Um, I, you know, the, 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 the stoking the fires being uber important is there's something there, you know? Uh, yeah, we don't know what it is yet, but there's something there. Yeah. Uh, and just, you know, like, like, we've already said the idea that every single person that's in there is an actor, including the nurses and the, the arbiters, I think is what they're called. Um, that's just creepy. Cause like <laughs> your fate and, and also like Edith's getting branded by some person who <laughs> doesn't have any medical training, probably like this is going to turn out bad. I mean, people get their eyeballs <laughs> plucked out. I just, well, the plucking out of eyeballs at medical treatment, how, how many people who do branding actually have medical training? <laughs> yeah, you probably I don't True, but, but usually they're training. branding animals, not people. <laughs> well, I mean, in fantasy situations when people are being branded as well, <laughs> I don't think those have medical training. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, to be fair, branding is as, because, as it's, some... because it's a wound that is also being. Uh, cauterized at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's not as dangerous, depending. But uh, I don't know. Yeah, ew. Yeah, I actually know two people who have voluntarily been branded, and I still don't understand that. But that was a <laughs> fraternity know. thing back in the day, at least in African American fraternities. These are the two guys I played basketball with. Didn't quite understand it, but as one said, dumbest thing I ever did, and the other guy never mentioned it, other than he had one. <laughs> Wow. I mean, I mean, you do you. Yeah. Yeah. I support your dreams. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so any last thoughts about the parlor before we move on to the bats? I think that might have been my favorite part so far. I could tell. The <laughs> <laughs> saddest thing about the parlor part specifically is that because of the time that it takes Sedlin to get like through the parlor and everything, and despite everything, and you find out that later that he like spent five weeks in the baths just fucking around basically and Maria was there mm -hmm. Maria Maybe. was there and he couldn't find her but probably not for very long no time wise she had to be because at this point yeah, he was outside for two days basement for a couple days parlor for a day no matter what your measurement of that time yeah. is it took him less than a week which means that Maria could not have been through the parlor. Yeah, but I, I didn't get the impression. Well, it's been a couple of months since I read the book, but I didn't think he, he was totally screwing around. He was, no, he wasn't. He like, was actively looking for her, not necessarily for a while. effective way, for a while. <laughs> and then it sounds like. The and then he was trying to figure out how to go to the next step because he figured he, she wasn't there. I mean, well, it sounds like the first couple days he's actively looking for her, but then he like runs out of hope and then just starts wallowing. That well, yeah, he he looks for her and then he realizes that all he the hotels realizes it's hopeless. Like within a few days, and he just sort of slumps. well, all of the hotels like catch on to him, and they're just like. And he she realizes that he's she's making too much of a scene and he freaks out a little bit. And it's right about that time that he yeah. meets uh, Tarot. And, you know, then it's like, it becomes this, well, now I've got this friend and we're just going to hang out by the fountains and drink ourselves into a stupor every night. And, and you know, I'm not judging, you know, what happened with him at all. Uh, I, still, I, I think, still had the I still had the impression, maybe I misread it, that he was still looking during the day and was so the just, way that I read at it. At the end of the day, he kind of you know to oh another day of nothing, no success. I just need a drink with his friend. The way You're that right, I read it, it becomes was, perfunctory. The way that I read it was very much that he was looking, but he wasn't doing anything new. He was doing that yeah. thing where he was yeah. repeating the same actions over and over again, hoping for something to change. So every day he was going to every single hotel and checking for her. So he wasn't doing anything different. And because we know now that Maria went directly to not a hotel and one of like the back street, like, like safe houses, we know that he would have never found her, but also it's like tragic in a way because we know that this whole time that Maria was like had like befriended the artist Ogis and Ogis Ogier, Ogier. Ogier, and that Ogier was literally sitting like right next to Senlin every single day when they went yeah. to dinner. And like just like the irony of that of that like Oh, it's of, a like, comedy of errors. It's a exactly. comedy of errors. And that's that's what I was trying to point out. And that's why I was kind of like, oh man, because like you know, finding out about what happened to Maria at the end, it's like, like in a way, it would have been less sad if she had not been that close to where yep. he was. But it's so much more sadder because she was literally right there. <sighs> yeah, and and you know, and and also not not only is he just kind of going through the motions at, at, after a certain point, but he's also he's spending less time doing it. And again, mm -hmm. I'm not like I'm not judging that because like he knew at some point that it was a lost cause, right? Yeah, he, he knew that they were the hotel me. people were onto him. He wasn't going to get any information. Um, he Dude, wasn't not lunch. trying, but he wasn't. It makes sense though, because like it's been five weeks. I haven't right. done anything for five weeks repeatedly every single day without getting really upset wait no i go to work and that upsets me huh. <laughs> well and also the difference there being that you have clear well hopefully you have oh, clear. Yeah. Like, these are the things that, that i'm doing these are the reasons why i'm doing them that and was they an are extreme so joke by the way <laughs> that was a joke <laughs> but like but like yes if, no if you like, had to do like the like the actions of a search that just got increasingly hopeless and people already told you it was impossible every single day there was like no negative judgment on him it was just like yeah. 
he was there for five weeks and she was basically like like you know that thing that they say like everybody's like five people removed from everybody else in the world he was one person removed from her one person removed and it was just so sad yep definitely yeah sad. and also, can we talk uh, about the irony of that creepy, like, women trafficking book that actually turned out to be plot relevant? Because that book came up and I was like, ew, we already know the tower is a terrible place. And I know stuff like this logically happens. But why are you telling me explicitly? And then they get to Maria's, like, this is what happened to Maria. And I'm like, oh, no. Maria, sweetie, look up. Look up. The, oh, yeah. the, I mean, well, you I, introduce I, Chekhov's sex trafficking book in act one and it has to pay off. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I really thought it was and the way, the way the book is written is so like nonchalant, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the way I've seen it described in summaries and like reviews of this book is like, Oh, it's a book for mail order brides. And it's like, I get where you're coming from, but they are abducting these women. Okay, they are abducting yeah. these women. Yeah, it's, it is, it's not, it it's is. not a mail order bride service where the girl's like, hey, yeah, I want to be a mail order bride. It's a mail order bride service where the girl's like, hey, I need help. And this dude's like, what if I give you fancy clothes and nice food and I tell you I'm going to solve all your problems, but in actuality, you're just going to marry this dude. It is literally the game, but uh, taken to a sex trafficking extreme. It is like pickup artists, except taking to sex trafficking extreme. Yeah. And happy to say that I'm not familiar with that. I'm not job. familiar with it either. What are you talking about? <laughs> What's the game? I think that's the name of it. It's uh, it's basically a pickup artist book. Maybe it's yes. not called the game. Maybe it's called something it's else. Like, it's like this like really weirdly misogynistic like Bible on how to like get women to like you while also being super misogynistic about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Game, the game penetrating is... the secret society of pickup artists by Neil Strauss. Gross. It yeah. Is... And is that a novel or is that a, no, no, it is. A, uh, it's not an expose. It's not a novel. It's, it's not a fictional it. novel. It is like in the guise of, saying penetrating the secret society of pickup artists he is revealing the secrets so that you can become a uh, effectively a pickup artist the secrets it's a it self-help book it is self toxic masculinity at its finest i'm pretty sure one of my exes read that book uh, many like, people did and and uh, like I'm, I'm i actually think he talked about it and i now that i'm thinking yeah. about it i'm just like wow yeah no yep. yep it is it is effectively sort of like a how to for seduction and dating for men who are willing to manipulate and um cajole and coerce women into having sex with them and while the men who are doing the original picking up in this society situation, whatever, aren't the pickup artists themselves. They are, they're, they're, they're like the, they're the middleman, right? Like yeah. they're the guy who's saying they're like, I know somebody who can help you and let me introduce you to this handsome, you would, you know, I guess, and I think in Mario's case, it was a handsome, wealthy, young ish man. In Mario's case, uh, is I don't know if he was ever described as handsome, but he was never described as not handsome, which is important. <laughs> and he was described as young. Um, and I think the funniest thing is that the pickup guide itself specifically states that most of the men do not have the qualities of like that you are looking for in a good woman. And he's like, and, and it was just, it was just the, the book was so gross. It was very the gross. fact that the person who. Senlin got the book from it was like the postal clerk or whatever was yep. blacking out sections of it too yeah. right there was a I lot of weird stuff in that section yeah i don't know it was what like was... what is happening here who 
Uh, or is that or is that person another actor though? To, that person was an no, actor. No, not the not in the no, baths. Those? Not in the baths. Oh no, that's right. That was that in the basement. So so. Uh, and I don't, you know, and I know uh, to to row when Senlin, and I I do want to go over the weird heist thing with Senlin. But when Senlin finally mm -hmm. gets the painting and he comes out and he discovers that Taro is being turned into a hod, and Taro is basically like, I faked our friendship, blah blah blah, like, mm -hmm. and you like, there's no way this is true, right? But. At least I never like I've never thought so. Um, yeah, it clearly was. I, he he didn't want Senlin to be implicated. Oh yeah, no, because, yeah, also, no, that was obvious. Uh, even Senlin realizes it. So I yeah. I just read that. Even, uh, Senlin, <laughs> even <laughs> Senlin, poor sot that he is. <laughs> so even Senlin realizes it. So as like he has a moment where he's like, "His like, how could you say this to me?" And then he's like, "Oh." Oh, he's trying to make sure I don't get implicated. Yeah. And like and like the fact that Senlin realizes it, like you know it's gotta be through that. <laughs> also though, poor Tarot, like his whole story is really depressing. You know, like he just yeah. he came to the baths to get away from it all and just stayed. stayed. Looked for 15 and, years or whatever it was, 17 years, whatever. As Senlin years, says. As Sinlin says, his story is Sinlin's story. The difference is that his wife escaped mm -hmm. the tower, went back, started, uh, you know, running the farm, and then started sending money. And in, you know, unfortunately, Maria does not escape, and in fact, is sex trafficked. Or at least yeah. that's that's where we are at this point. We don't actually know where Maria is at this point. We know where she was up to a certain point. But obviously, like I mean, after you know what Ogier says yeah. is, we can yeah. infer that that is where she currently is. And uh, so, gosh, I the, my notes for for this these two parts are like kind of all over the place because there's a bunch of quotes and everything. Um, but, uh, oh, also the, the, the name, by the way, of the sex trafficking book is the confidences of a wife monger, mm -hmm. which gross. Uh, I do. So when, when Senlin meets Ogier, you know, just to lead up into the dumb heist <laughs> <laughs> when the Senlin meets, yeah, the, this is the, this is the dumbest timeline. Senlin, uh, <laughs> when Senlin meets Ogier, like one of the things that he sees is this topless painting of Maria, and he's like, ah, "My wife, topless," and he's like freaking out about it, which is hilarious. Yep. Um, and then Ogier's just, like, ignore he, that. <laughs> he specifically talks about how it's not even necessarily that she's topless that bothers him. It, it, it mm. like that that this man painted her topless that bothers him. It's like the vulnerability and the like. Mm -hmm. it, it's very interesting, and I'm I'm interested to see it where Sidney goes in the character because of that. Yeah, and I, I I clocked that too. That it was a very desexualized objection. Of yeah, exactly. Was, which was very interesting. And, and he's aware of that. Like he's aware that he's like, yes. I should be angry about this other thing, but what I'm actually angry about is this. It's very interesting. So interesting. And I think honestly, Tara, I think this is one of the reasons that I vibe with Senlin a lot more than I vibed with Lawrence, because yeah. they're both. <laughs> Both boring in different ways. But Lawrence is boring in this uptight, honor, I'm always correct way. And Senlin is boring in this book smart, I know nothing, I'm a coward way. And I find the I'm a coward way so much more interesting than the I must be honorable and always be honorable way. Because so I don't think Senlin, Senlin is, is boring. able to like 
notice his faults, whereas Lawrence wasn't. And also, I would I would go a step further to say that I don't think I ever found Senlin annoying like I did Lawrence. Like, and I think that's because so much of his like brain nonsense is him being introspective and him being like, look what I fucked up. Look at my flaws. Look at these things. Look at that thing. And the reason I found Lawrence annoying was because things would happen that were clearly his fault and he would be like, oh, yes. Oh my god, we lost <laughs> not entirely. Gone forever. Yeah. Uh, I would say this. Uh, I don't really think someone is annoying. I think he's frustrating. And that's there's I, a big difference there. I mean, he, he, I guess I'm a little jumping the gun. He is a pr fairly quick study, though. Yeah. He He's adaptable. Uh, I would also say that he is. Um, I don't think he's boring. I don't think he's annoying. I think he has lots of faults, but I think that those faults are well written in a way that Lawrence's faults were not well written, uh, and those make him relatable. And so, because we're seeing the tower through his eyes. That's why, like, this is still a very engaging book, even though there mm -hmm. are plenty of times where Sinlin is like, why would you do that? Oh, I, would, I would never do that. But, like, I can understand... <laughs> Nami's back. I can Hi, understand so why he does those things, and I can oh, understand Nami. those faults <laughs> and all of those pieces. And so I relate more to him than I ever relate to Lawrence, who is, to Nami's point. We've lost phone Nami now. No, Phonami is still here. She just she just can't really hear you. So I think you might just have Nami's ear. Hello? <laughs> so, that's a weird Turn the We can hear you, Nami. Please stop doing that. That was weird. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to see inside your ear, Nami. <laughs> Uh, I can't wait to edit this. <laughs> I can't wait to edit this podcast episode. I don't, don't want to see inside it, your ear, Nami. In even my most intimate relationships, I don't think I've ever like tried to stare inside somebody's ear. So I would appreciate it if you never gave me that gift again. Um. So so uh, yeah. I mean, I think that. Oh God, there's just like. There's so much, there's so much going on in the bats, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so we're we obviously we were talking about Semlin being annoying slash frustrating. I think it depends on who's reading the book, and I, I mean everybody's opinion is valid. I don't know that I ever found him annoying. Frustrating is the term I would use. Um, like I, I think John said, he's a quick study. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes he gets things wrong, despite being a quick study but he is a quick study. Uh, I think you he know. just like really made me want to shake him. Cause I feel like even at my most naive, least straight smart, because I was when, before I went to college, I was, I too was a bookish nerd who thought she knew it all. But then mm -hmm. I realized that I knew <laughs> nothing, but like, even at my most naive, I don't think I was ever, ever this naive, you know? And Quick I think question. I think that's what's frustrating about Senlin. Were any of the four of us not the like I'm mostly book smart and pretty naive in the ways of the world up until we well, went to college? Well, well, I think. Well, I was gonna say I think in some ways we are all very naive in certain areas. For example, I didn't realize people actually went to church. <laughs> I thought they were a bunch of old empty buildings. You know, I had no idea. Wow. I didn't realize that like there yeah. are people wow. that go to church every Sunday. It, like, it, it wasn't until like high years. school that I found that that people actually went. <laughs> well, and see, that's a that's a like more that's a cultural difference. Yeah, it's there. growing up in New York, and I yeah. didn't have any friends who I had friends who were identified as religious. Or, or with a religion, but none of them actually went to church, right? It's like, yeah, see, and I grew up in the South, <laughs> and I grew up in a fairly, like, in terms of Christian denominations, Episcopalians, like, pretty liberal, pretty, like, uh, you know, not as, we're not Southern Baptists, I'll right. say. Right. Uh, but, like, my family went to church, so, like, it was rare for me to know people who didn't go to church. 
I mean, I grew up in New England where it was, I was the rare one because I went to a Baptist church. Like I grew up in a Baptist church, but most of my friends were Catholic, but almost everyone I knew went to some form of church. And uh, see, that's the other thing. I didn't also, realize they were all hell. different. I thought they were all the same. <laughs> <laughs> no, sadly, a uh, very young age, I was made very. It was made very clear to me that Catholicism and Catholics were very different from what I grew up with. Because, uh, like, my my Catholic friends weren't even allowed to like hang out with me at church events. Like, I'd be like, "Yeah, my church group is going bowling. You guys want to go bowling?" And it was like, "No, we can't. We're Catholic. We can't go to Baptist events." And I was like, mm -hmm. "I mean, they my church wouldn't have a problem with me going to your events, but okay." Uh, yeah. And of course, look now, at you, like the the whitest people in the chat room are the ones who are like, we went to church all the time. Yeah. Um, Listen, well, okay. I super thought it was normal that everybody just had little temples in their own houses that they would pray in because that's what we that do. That makes so much more sense. Seriously. Exactly. Honestly, right? like, so you're that Devi. makes more sense to me. So, so that was a, that, like so that was accurate and never have I ever. Oh yeah, so we have so basically in our basement we have a specific room that is the David Mane, so it literally translates to God's room, and so that's the little temple. So you have idols there, and um, you can light incense, and so um, most mornings and many, I don't know how often, but I think most days my mom will go down and she'll like light incense and do like a little morning prayer for it. Um, I personally have my own statue of Ganesh in my room and I have like a little, like I have a tiny little setup in my room just of my, actually wait, you know, since I'm on my phone, you can do a show and tell. I mean, and here's the thing, like that makes so much more sense than driving 20, 25, 30 minutes to yes. go listen to some cishet white dude talk about <laughs> the Bible. <laughs> I just knocked over a drill, don't mind me. And I say that, you know, and, and yeah. I realize that there are there are definitely religions that have white, uh, I mean, white, there are white rabbi, uh, not white, gotcha. I'm going to put you down for a second. There are female rabbis, there are female pastors at like in uh, Methodist churches, whatever. Uh, but yeah. Um, There's so, a large pile of laundry that I haven't put away that I was climbing over, but that I got stuck over. Cause like, you know how, when you do like a split over stuff and then the split just keeps going down. But so that's what yeah, happened that's there. But yeah. So um, anyway, uh, it's totally <laughs> off topic, honestly, for a bit there, a but weird. I'm never going to mind that. Um, the, I don't even know how we got on this topic. Oh, Lord. So, the heist. Yeah, yeah, the heist. Um, well, well, quick study. Pre previous, uh, previous to the heist, uh, you know, they're in, they're in these public baths. The scenery is all painted. There's no windows. So, Senlin, when he first gets there, he's like, this is what I pictured, you know, the tower to be. But, it's all false, right? It's a false front, false face. Um, and he, uh, so he goes through all of his drama, <laughs> different kind of drama than than the, the parlor, let's be honest. But he goes to this new drama in the baths and then we get to the heist, which is, uh, you know, he meets Ogier. Ogier has painted his wife and he says like, I have information, but I'm not giving it to you unless you do this for me. And it's stealing a painting that was apparently stolen from him by the commissioner. Now, the commissioner is like, at this point, he's the big bat, right? Like, we've met some crappy people, but this is like, he's the big bat of the bats. He rules over the bats, and he's the one that's like participating in uh, live executions and all this other shit and uh he's this really weird guy who's super particular and he ha he he has quote unquote has allergies or something <laughs> which is like he's a hypochondriac yeah he's, he's paranoid he's, about yeah. getting sick yeah exactly he doesn't like smelling so there's this whole heist thing where Senlin goes to a party pretending to be like a 
journalist that's going to write an article about Ogier. And then he sees the, he, he, you know, Ogier shows him his best or his favorite painting. And Senna is like, whoa, 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 there's fumes coming off this painting. It's so stupid. <laughs> but it works. <laughs> he, he poses a professor specifically. Oh, it was a yeah, professor. This book okay. Gave me such genre whiplash because if yes. you had asked me what I expected to happen in the middle end of part two, a heist would not have been my answer. And I also would not have expected Senlin to basically pull off a con either because he does. That he was does pretty. Not. <laughs> It was very smart of him. And like, he, he like really, 90% like, does, 80% does, something he, like that. He, he, he cons like, one person and then completely botches his other con roll. His deception so roll against though. the like, guard is like a one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's because the guard was actually with it. Mm. Yeah. The guard also was like good at his job and yeah. had like a high uh, insight roll. Or he rolled a nat twenty on that. Oh no, yeah, he rolled he a twenty. He on that 20. 20. He <laughs> had a high insight roll. He didn't need a nat twenty. He like rolled yeah. decently, but like he started <laughs> from a good modifier. That's true. Actually, uh, that was probably like a like a twelve or a thirteen. Because <laughs> he gets he gets the guard super fucking drunk, like legitimately really drunk, and the guard still was like, "You're not fooling." fucking anybody here like you, this is dumb as shit your whole plan is dumb as shit he, <laughs> the first part of the plan is good when he goes to the party when he commit convinces the commissioner all those parts actually go really well mm -hmm. and part of that is taru or however you pronounce his name like he greased the wheels he does a great job the entire part where, that does not involve the commissioner where he actually goes into the customs area and he's defuming the painting and all of that nothing goes right there well i would i would put it this way for our uh long time listeners the first part of this plan <laughs> well, went them. off and sort of was orchestrated as though it was played by kaz the first part of this yeah the first part was almost flawless i the completely second part of that. this plan went off as though Jasper and Wylan had concocted it <laughs> while fighting about Jasper oh no you're kissing no, the no, you, that, that's not and Jasper was drunk at the time that's not Jasper fair to Jasper was and Wylan drunk and Wylan was mad because Jasper kissed the wrong boy that's that's what this plan is and they're just trying to make it shittier for each other and they're like no why don't you why, why don't you just 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 drug him a lot yeah yeah why don't you drug him more <laughs> Yeah, it's it's very I mean, I just remember being so shocked that Senlin pulled anything off at all. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. But the commissioner is dumb apparently. Yeah. <laughs> he is well, so worried about his allergies or whatever. I love <laughs> Like John the hypochondriac. I love the He's way that, that Senlin <laughs> puts this and it is it's actually before he he runs the con on the commissioner and that is he realizes he cannot win in any w way where he is putting his best traits against the commissioner or any of the defenses so what he chooses to do is win in a contest of flaws and i thought that like that phrase winning in a contest of flaws i was like Mwah. Beautiful, well done. So Fuck yes. The problem is that as soon as it's no longer a contest of flaws, he's back to the point of he can't win. He does not have the skill set for this. And so when he does go into the customs office and he's up against, and I, I am blanking on the guard's name, nah. who, like, from Sinlin's perspective, doesn't really observe any of the things that Sinlin has tried to set up to uh, deceive him. Still is like, boy, you dumb as hell. <laughs> just, just this how is Senlin the worst forgery. Him. Like, you are just dumb as fuck. <laughs> Senlin basically describes him as like a disappointed dad as him. And I'm just like, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, we all. It was very all lucky for like, some of them that this guard like had it out for the commissioner anyway. Oh yeah, also, that's my also, favorite though, part. I Look, think Jared. the other thing though that really got to me was the excruciating like description of him pulling out the staples and then reinserting the staples for the pincher backing. I swear, I was just like actively dying there. I was like, Cass Brecker <laughs> would never let this happen in his heist. That's like my level. Like I, <laughs> I knew that sensation. I was like, oh, I've totally tried to push those kinds of staples down and how much it hurts like that sucks i'm there <laughs> with you but that just goes to show like how not, not skilled how not equipped for this he is and you're absolutely right like it is purely the fact that this guard is like fuck the commissioner that dude like if i told him about you and i ratted you out he would demote me like he doesn't even have the right processes in place to be like oh you 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 had my back you got my back i'm going to support you no he'd have me patrolling the toilets next he doesn't give a fuck so fuck that dude i'll give you you know what how much money you got <laughs> you tell me how much money you got and i'll tell you how much time i'll give you that's how much of a head start you get and, and someone's like i got nothing i got like two and a half whatevers and he's <laughs> whatever like, the hey, monetary hey, system is I'm being generous. You can have two hours. I'm going to be here being drunk for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. The fact that he gets out of there with the real painting is just like, well, just wouldn't have expected. It's like, again, comedy of errors. Wouldn't have expected this of Semlin, but he does it. Right. Um, and then I he, think in he, a way it made for really good storytelling because, yeah. you know, it like, did. Because, like, up until now, like, in most heists, it's entertaining when something goes wrong and they have to think their way out of it. Mm -hmm. But because we know that Senlin can't do that because this isn't a heist book, Senlin's not a heist character, the entertainment and the fact comes off in it basically going off perfectly. Because for all intents and purposes, it did. And, and I just think, like, literally of all things I expected, like, Ogier, like... Oh, yeah. I, what, how do you even say his name? I don't know. I feel like it should be like fancy and French and. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But like the moment <laughs> that he basically is like, oh, this is what you have to do. And I'm like, and then Sedlin dies and the other. Mm. And then part three is about somebody else. Part <laughs> the rest of the series is just about Maria, I guess. Like I, I was like, there's no way. There's no way. And then he does it. And I was like, huh what yeah and then he learns everything that has happened to maria and he is on his way to the next level to level three yeah He's um, level so i have a question how big is this tower i mean i get it yes. is it like miles wide because i i mean it's gotta be when when senlin is standing at the bottom of it in the market he can't see the top it's also, like the clouds about, surround it. You, you remember the first part where um, they talk about the notes that are attached to the tower? They talk about how people can spend their entire lives going around the tower to try to read all the notes. Because you can't get around the tower quickly enough to be able to read all the notes in a day. So there's always going to be more notes by the time you get around to the other side of the tower. Yeah. Because people get lost lost so much that gives you the beginnings of a sense of how gigantic this tower is yeah but the the the, the lost the, the lost thing at the beginning i i still haven't figured out if that was magical or not what on how they get separated oh no it's not magical no, no it's no. just it's it's a gigantic market that constantly is shifting and changing and there's no way to track people i think that there's no <sighs> At this point in time, there's no proof that there's any sort of magic involved in yeah. what happens at the tower. This series is, or this this book particularly, what it introduces us to is a pseudo steampunk world. No, no, I get that, but at the beginning, I still wasn't sure if it was magic that. 
of yeah, no, no, no. The it's cause of the disappearance of why people are always losing them. Because I mean, it seems to me, yes, the market's changing, but there's got to be some place that is not changing, right? I mean, so didn't they come? So you, didn't they I come on a train? You grew up in New York City, right? Yeah, now? but they came on a train, right? Yes. Yeah. So they couldn't go back to the train station. It was the, the, the assumption you needed the train station. I'm just that that is absolutely like so for me, and th this was very realistic to me because I've traveled to uh, like countries where I spoke. I haven't spoken the language. I've traveled to large cities, things like that, and it's very easy to like get disoriented. It's very easy to. Uh, to do to lose somebody and so that's like i or probably you would be like hey let's meet back at the the train station or let's uh, let's set up a a, a a a meeting place right but if you haven't done that and you lose track of somebody how would you find somebody in new york city you right. know like if you hadn't said hey we're gonna meet at this specific place well that's true but i always at least in the in the pre-cell phone universe i always had a plan to be somewhere somewhere if you got lost that was always I, absolutely and, and i did too but sunland we learned very early on that sunland does not think that way sunland doesn't have a meeting place he knows everything cool. but knows nothing yeah he thinks that if she just walks away for a minute she'll be able to find her way back Back to where he is but then he leaves for a few minutes and for all we know they cross paths in those few minutes right right like we don't know exactly what happened but we do know this is a giant sprawling marketplace it is difficult to navigate and people are constantly getting lost because things are constantly changing not from a magical standpoint but because people are just like it's, it's like a giant flea market where you only have a certain amount of time booked at the flea market and then somebody else is immediately coming in and replacing the uh, ladies intimates with housewares yeah and 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 like, like even more than that though all i kind of imagined was like if you could imagine like a ren fair type setup and you ex except like the booths were interchangeable or even not even that if you imagine a Ren Faire setup and somebody who's not directionally aware and there's a lot of people, like, you're going to get lost. And if you have a location to go back to and meet up with, that's one thing, but their location wasn't stationary and he also wasn't there for a time. So like Nick said, I suspect, like, Maria's not an idiot. I suspect that she did probably go back to the location but thought it was the wrong one because he wasn't there anymore. And, like, how this story is a comedy of errors, like, I would not be surprised if that's what ended up happening and also like i suspect john that like most dads you have that innate ability to actually navigate spaces now once you become a father you just sort of well, have direction sense kind of I, again also i grew i also, grew up in a i grew up as a free-range kid at a young age where i was going into manhattan by myself at 10 so oh, yeah like my dad so like you so like city kids have like a built-in instinct of like this is how you navigate crowded spaces most people do not have it. my sister my family has it because my dad was a city kid and even though we grew up in the suburbs he was always like this is how you do it and i have a direction sense and my sister does not but we all have the sense of oh we have to set up a meeting place to get back but sedlin's like a fucking idiot Yep. I think I have those senses because I grew up in the middle of nowhere, but I uh, am so type A that I can't. I have a really good sense of direction and also a sense of like, well, yeah, we all need to be back at the same place, right? So, um, also, like, Sedlin Loki gives me like Hermione Granger book one, like, on crack <laughs> vibes, like, straight up know it all. <laughs> like, I know everything, everything is fine. Uh, okay, so because we're, we're approaching like the hour 15 mark, and there's a few other things I wanted to touch on. Um, I wanted to talk about themes in this book so far. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the main one being, 
the loss of innocence. Um, the irony of Senlin being this like learned teacher who has to admit how little he knows. Um, and also, you know, as a teacher, he's been very set in like, this is life, these are the rules, etc. But he be he becomes jaded with like the rules or like structure of what he has been used to. Uh, and then also the whole like trust no one, each person has like motives. Um, there's just so much like, uh, there's so much going on here. Um, and, and some of it for sure has to be saved for next week when we do, you know, cover the last like part of the book. Um, but any thoughts on the, the themes of like the loss of innocence and the becoming jaded with what you expected from the world. Um, I don't know. Like there's, I don't, there's so much going on here. I, how do you cover it? In a I feel like my, of time? I, hashtag mood. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I got. <laughs> For once I'm being concise. Thank you. <laughs> You're all so proud of you right now. Nami. Yes, Nami. Claps. <laughs> snaps, 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 as they would say in my sorority. <laughs> also, as, as uh, the Quakers would say, friend speaks my mind. Uh, I I completely agree. Like, that, that's just what it is, you know? <laughs> like, that, that's, that's fucking, like, realizing that the world isn't set up to help you. <laughs> It's set up to help people who are much better off than you are. Loki a bit jealous because it sounds like he got to his 30s without realizing this. And I kind of wish I did too, you know? Well, but uh, so here's the thing where I'm like, nope, I'm glad I didn't do that. Because those are the people who grew up in like the middle of nowhere and never had the opportunity to be exposed to other cultures, other ways of life. Um, I grew up in... A, a town in North Carolina called Chapel Hill. And it's one of those towns where like, it's a pretty liberal town, especially for North Carolina. Um, but it's this special brand of liberal where we think that we're way more liberal than we actually are. And so then when I actually started getting uh, exposed to other ways of life and other cultures and things like that, I was like, oh, oh, I just saw it from the perspective of like a, a colonizer, not from the perspective of like, oh, I can appreciate and um, even start to begin to understand other ways of life. It was like, oh, it's quaint that these people think this way, you know? And mm -hmm. and so that's not the same mentality that we're talking about in terms of Simon or anything like that. But uh, it is very easy to grow up that way to believe that the way that you were raised is the appropriate way and anything else is maybe like interesting or like. Well, that's not what Senlin is though. And, and I think you're absolutely right. And I'm, I'm not trying to say that. To to make. Like I'm not jealous of the idea of being like a realistic version of that. I'm jealous of the fantasy life that Senlin has led, where he has led a life where he thinks that everyone is moral and that morality truly is what drives humanity and that everyone is kind and good and loving. And I'm jealous of that. That's I'm jealous of like, of like your years as a child when you think that the meanest thing that somebody can do is be, be upset at you because you're playing with their toy. I'm jealous of being a kid and not realizing that people would hate me because my skin color is different. You know, th that's what I'm jealous of. I'm not jealous of like, I'm not saying that I would like a closeted experience within my own community where I thought what we were doing is always right. What I would want is to grow up like Senlin, having the proof that people always functioned morally. Oh, so see, that's because the that's difference in our, I did grow up that way. And I grew up that way because I grew up in a fairly privileged uh, area and I'm white and a guy. And so like, that is awesome. what I grew up as. And I had to I undo that, that learning in order to understand that like, oh, that's actually really fucked up. 
Yeah, girls never grow up that way. Period. No Not matter. Agree. agree completely. How sheltered a girl is. That's a that the ability to grow up thinking that the world is good is a complete. And and I understand <laughs> that that some of that jealousy of growing up that way comes from the fact that you never were that was never possible for you. Uh, it. And because I am a white man who grew up in a place of privilege, it was a default for me. And that's so fucked up. Like, like the, I, 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 we could spend another hour. Well, no, that's not true. We could spend another like days, weeks. I don't know. Like, whatever. <laughs> fucked up that is. Well, Nick, but I mean, Nick, like, your only topic of conversation for the rest of our friendship, and it would still endure a lifetime. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, I mean, and and you know, for my part, like, I grew up in a really privileged place too. Um, literally, the only part about my life that was that wouldn't, you know, knock with the privilege is that I'm a woman, but I am a white woman. Um, you know, obviously now I, I, the past like couple years or so, I have been trying to move into like, I do identify as non-binary and whatnot, but like growing up, uh, that's, that wasn't an option, honestly. Um, but I still grew up in a very kind of, my town as a whole wasn't necessarily wealthy, but we were still a farm town in Connecticut, uh, which is, I don't even know. Like I, I, I was very, very, very sheltered and I resonate a little bit with Senlin, you know, because of that, as much as he frustrates me at times. Um, so it's, it's, it, seeing his sort of like that, that loss of innocence as he like moves up through the tower and has to admit that he, you know, nothing, nothing, Thomas Senlin, <laughs> um, you know, and, and becomes jaded with the rules and structure that he's always been so much a part of uh, is really interesting. You know, how he learns very quickly that everybody has these, complex motives um or maybe not even very quickly uh he 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 learns to trust no one very quickly and i think it's later you know that mostly through maybe Tarot and ogier that everybody has these complex motives um but w without you know going into anything from the last you know half ish of this book uh he does see a lot of like the systemic oppression, um, you know, that people go into the tower not really knowing anything. And because of that, they are, uh, I mean, like, like Tarot knows what happens when you become a hod, right? But, or well, and even, even, Adam, you know, he lost his, what was it, sister or whatever. Uh, I, it's, 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 it's a lot of like, you see these people that went into this blindly and they were taught very hard lessons very quickly. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to say, I don't want to like put my foot in my mouth here, honestly, because it's, it's, it's hard to describe what all goes on in the first two parts of this book without spoiling the last part if you've actually read it. Uh, but the the fact of the matter is a lot of people, like people go into this tower for the most part blindly and we see so many of them, not just Senlin himself, get just screwed, right? So yeah, I don't know. <laughs> It's super interesting in a way because you know as much as I keep saying that Senlin is very very naive like the fact of the matter is that if any of the four of us 
had happened to be in the same situation and went to this tower on vacation like yeah we would have been naive about a lot of this stuff and like we wouldn't have expected it to be as bad as it is but also like we still would have been naive about some stuff. We still would have been inclined to be perhaps like 1% more trusting. We also still probably would not have fallen asleep in a room with a stranger like Adam and had him rob us blind, you know? And like, so it's, it's like stuff like that. That's like, that's like, I can see on some level that like Senlin is absolutely the, like, like the nth level of naive for like, probably for literary reasons, because I think it's more interesting that he's that naive. But also at the same time, you can see how just regular, smart, streetwise people would also get screwed over in this place. Because Edith, like, Edith seems really fucking smart. Like, she seems like she's got a good head on her shoulders. And the fact that she was here and ended up being stuck with Senlin, and that she ended up being the one screwed over, like, it's absolutely nonsensical. She forgot to soak the fires, Nami. (laughs) How dare she? He was in the middle of getting like almost murdered, like. But she, but she didn't soak the fires, dude. Dude, I don't think she was gonna get murdered. There's that portion where like the the crazy dude's going after her, and I was like, if there's a rape scene, I'm putting this book down right now. But like, like I straight up thought that 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 like. I would have absolutely warned people if there was yeah. something like that. Oh, so. <laughs> I've read these, read and I would that have warned. That is how it had gone down, to be honest <laughs> with you. Thank you for having my back, but also, like, <laughs> the plot, the fact that at the plot point, like, she, like, like, Senlin saved her then, I was like, I was like, okay, good, but that's also what I thought was going to happen, because this dude was, like, so mad, and that's what mad dudes do, and especially if they feel ownership over you, and she was his fantasy wife. Mm-hmm. What the fuck? <laughs> but continuing on, like, so I think the thing about Senlin that made him like ultimately very charming to me was like that portion where I think it's with Thoreau where he like goes on that like morality rampage and he's like, how dare people do these terrible things? And like, why would people even do this? And like, it the fact to me that his naivete wasn't in the fact that like, That, like, he, like, it really does seem that he truly hadn't seen anything bad in the world. That he truly did believe that everything was good. Because at the Mm -hmm. point that he gets in the tower, he sees one bad thing and he starts to immediately identify these as bad things, even when they're not happening to him. Like, he picks up that woman monger's book and he's immediately like, this is disgusting trash. How could this possibly exist? This is evil. You You know, and, like, he's not, like, the victim of that situation. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> but like it's all this stuff with Senlin that like really makes you feel like he's like a little 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 baby and he just went outside into the outside world and he's like, oh no, evil exists. <laughs> it's like he never read a fantasy book because here's what I think, <laughs> right? Right? There's like there's like the level of naive that I think I was, which was I read a lot of fantasy books and I knew that evil and bad things existed, but I thought that good always won somehow, ultimately. And then there's Senlin who's only ever read um, textbooks about fish. And he thinks that there is no such thing as evil and all that there is is fish and everything's good and people are moral. (laughs) Because he's also only read history books written by the winners. But so Senlin, Senlin thinks there is no evil. Baby Nami thought there was evil, but that good always wins. Both of us went to the tower, and we were like, oh shit, evil here. Oh shit, fuck. Well, we don't know that, we don't know that evil event doesn't eventually get conquered at the end of this. We haven't I mean, finished the story yet. yet. Not yet. But right now, it looks real dim. <laughs> it's not that great for good right now. Look at this. <laughs> Unless this author goes in a very different direction than basically every other like fantasy setting that has happened in the last however many years, like there might be some good points, but it ain't gonna be a happy ending. Maybe not totally. But <laughs> I'm not never note, totally happy ending. It's never we're like we're only we're only yay. like a little over halfway through the first book. So yeah, we're, I think we're I think yeah, yeah. So before, before fighting his wife. 
Yeah. And this is why this It'll is so much better than the Summer Air series. Finds his wife. <laughs> yes. This, yeah, like, <laughs> this is why this is better than the Summer the, Like, we're halfway through the first fucking book, and we're like, oh my god, there's so many things to talk about. Fuck. <sighs> okay, so let's close out uh any last thoughts i mean i i've kind of said my pieces um i think there there were some other things that i mentioned but now i'm worried that one of them at least might have that i put in the document might have been a spoiler mm -hmm. i thought it wasn't but it, it might have been so uh <laughs> sorry guys right. i try i tried right. so hard didn't matter to me. Um, I, yeah. I finished we knew that book. there was something else going on with that character we just also, didn't know anything about what it was also, it's okay because I have anybody that you could have spoiled. I was definitely the best because I've already tried to spoil things for myself, but this book has no summaries online, so I haven't been <laughs> able to spoil things for myself. Do you know how much anxiety I have right now? There's a reason I read it so fast. It's because yeah, I if cannot. If you're somehow just randomly joining us, Nami actually really likes spoilers. I love them. So I tend to be a very <laughs> anxious person in my reading in that I read to escape and I read to be calm and in control. And I do not feel in control when I am worried about characters. So I will frequently spoil things for myself so I can feel more in control and therefore have more enjoyment of the reading experience, which I understand is weird. I do this with all Mia, video games, TV shows. Clearly not a trauma response. <laughs> what? He's no, if, I must How admit, no, I mean, if I did that, I wouldn't even bother finishing the book. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to call you out on main like that. <laughs> it's okay, just at me next time. <laughs> <laughs> I truly do find the enjoyable part of stories to be the storytelling, not the So for me, regardless of whether or not I know the answer, seeing exactly how that answer comes about is always infinitely more entertaining to me. And also in that way, I can, you know, alert myself to things that might freak me out extra. Cough, abuse, cough. <laughs> you you yeah. know, like yeah. all, all those lovely trigger warnings, which don't actually trigger me, but I still do find upsetting on certain days, you know? But it's like, that's just me. So yeah, feel free to just DM me spoilers, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you've read these books and you know the spoilers, well, how far are you in off. now? Should I just tell you what happens? Off no, <laughs> well, no, don't tell line, her. Make if, her read. If you and Nami wanted to share spoilers offline. Do whatever you feel comfortable with. Between the two of you, not in our group yeah. chat. No, no, not no, in no, our I group should. chat. <laughs> Even I though I've read, read the this. first two parts, as per our reading assignment, I do not want to be spoiled. I don't really, you know, as I said, I would hate to, I, if I were spoiled uh, or, or I ever like read the what happens in a book beforehand, I guarantee you I probably wouldn't finish it. The only thing that I really appreciate, I really appreciate when I get spoilers that are like, hey, there is a rape scene coming up or there is like serious sexual assault things coming up. Like I really don't, I, uh, it, it, if that gets sprung on me, and it's a really, particularly if it's well written, uh, I I might just like straight up check out of a book uh, if I'm not prepared for that. So yeah, I appreciate I, it when I, I have a heads up on those things. Yeah, I Outlander, Outlander, I checked the fuck out of those books. Like first episode, there's three a quarters. I watch the rest. I three quarters, I three quarters through the way of the first Outlander book, I was like, nope. What I appreciated that one. That was me too, Nami. First episode, I was like, I was super excited about it because everybody was talking about it. And I watched the first episode and I was like, nope, I'm noping out of this. I checked out. And like, here's the thing. If I had been warned and I went into it warned, I could have watched it. But since exactly. I wasn't warned, I was like, oh, oh, shocked, not ready, run away. Yep. Uh, but anyway, off topic. So uh, again, do we have any last thoughts about this book? About Senlin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this book gave me genre whiplash, and I had a really yes. great time because I had the attention span of a goldfish, and even my goldfish brain couldn't get bored. Because by the time I figured out what was happening, we were already someplace new. I agree with you, and it also, I, I don't. It sounds like I might be the only one doing the audiobook this time, but I really enjoyed the audiobook. Um, it's. 
a great way to experience this particular setting. And um, so I highly recommend it. And I'm excited. Is, any, to is anyone known it. reading it? I don't think so. Oh, hang on. I'll check while do you, 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 you tell your thoughts and I'll, I'll check while I. Yeah, while Jonathan, any doing. last like, thoughts? Hey, don't yeah. spoil the third part. <laughs> <laughs> well, I flew through the first book once I started reading and flew through half of the second book. But then a book I've been waiting for forever came out. So I then read The Expanse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you're, enjoy you're enjoying the series. That's all I, am, I need to know. I am. But now yeah. I got to get back to it because I've now finished The Expanse. So. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 need to, I need to actually start rereading the second book for sure. So, Wait, is the whole Expanse series done now with this yes, book? Or it's it's over. So it was the oh final. My gosh. So George R. R. Martin's protege uh, finished, but George hasn't. So, <laughs> are we surprised? Because I'm not. No. And the no. protege wrote a nine a nine book epic. So <laughs> <laughs> that was turned into a really good adaptation. Mm -hmm. Agree. It is. Well, I look. I mean, I'm going to still defend the first four seasons of Game of Thrones. But absolutely oh, agree. Those seasons were great. It was, it was, they were doing great. It was the post-George stuff they botched. <laughs> no, I no, mean, they botched four. Point, there was only the yeah, amount they of- Yeah, they botched like, four and five too, but. The, up until that point, there was only the amount of unnecessary rape that was already in the books. <laughs> and it wasn't until after that point where they started adding extra rapes that actually like specifically harmed the story. So I agree with you. The first four seasons were solid. Yeah. yeah, the first four seasons minus Dorn, because I can't remember when Dorn. That was showed season up. five. Season five. No, yeah, oh, it was, it was five. season five. Season five. They five. Really start I mean, the Dorn is shown in the first four seasons were great. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, that's true. Because you do get Ober Oberyn mm -hmm. and Alaria earlier. They yeah. were good, and then yeah. Alaria becomes a murder hobo <laughs> and says, "Let's murder kids." Yeah, a murder hobo, and not even like in a good way. I mean, she wasn't even Dexter. <laughs> oh, exactly. God, we're going so off topic. Right now. Like Dexter. <laughs> <laughs> We've got so many good quotes this episode. I hope anybody who listens to this as a podcast, uh, maybe I'll delete the Game of Thrones talk because I don't want to like spoil people who for some reason at this point in their lives that are reading these books. Back Season <laughs> five Thrones. of the Game of Thrones TV series. Like we're not, we're not doing serious spoilers at that point. I think anybody who is going to invest into starting watching Game of Thrones at this point was just done a favor to be informed to only watch it yeah. through season four. If you have <laughs> not watched Game of Thrones, don't watch past season four. <laughs> Anyway, all of us who, by the way, love Game of Thrones, some of us even had a convention that we created in order to support <laughs> Game of Thrones. Well, no, like Song of Ice and Fire, let's be clear. Yes. My convention supports Song of Ice and Fire, not exclusively Game of Thrones to an extent, yes. obviously, yes. but yes. yeah, yes. Uh, Ice and Fire Con, you know, like we are very much like a book centric convention. Shout out to Ice and Fire Con, which I hope Holler. to actually get to once the pandemic is over. This year. This year. This year. Uh, yep. 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 <laughs> okay. All right. So on that note, uh, we will be talking about the second half-ish, which is part three of Sendlin Ascends one week from today, Wednesday, January 19th. Uh, but once again, I'm Tara, along with Nick, Jonathan, and Nami. Thank you for joining us for Sagas and Sass, and we will see you next time. Bye! Bye! Bye. Bye.